There's one major source of illness, and I'm talking about any kind of illness, uh, whether that's so-called mental illness or uh, physical illness, and that's childhood trauma. And this is true whether I'm talking about anxiety, depression, ADHD, addiction, psychosis, um, bipolar illness. Or if I'm talking about multiple sclerosis, cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, uh, colitis, Crohn's disease, uh, ALS, scleroderma, and as I said, malignancy as well. And that seems like a very uh, bold statement. But uh, today I'll be concentrating on the physical side of it. When I say physical side, I'm talking about the illnesses uh, that are not considered to be mental illnesses. Um, as a matter of fact, what I'll be telling you, and I just, I'm just giving you a, a preview of what I'll be saying, is that, um, and it's quite okay, I, I wish you would argue with me, uh, both in your mind and also verbally. Uh, that's the way we get through to the heart of things. I'll be saying you, to you that just about everything, not everything, but just about everything that we call illness, begins, uh, is rooted in compensations and adaptations that have to do with uh, childhood trauma. And um, I'll uh, quote you uh, something to that effect, just to prove that I'm not totally crazy. <laughs> or, if I am crazy, I'm not alone in my craziness. This is from the journal Pediatrics. Uh, which is the official journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the article appeared in their journal six years ago now, in February the um, February of 2012. And the article is from the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. And here's what they say in their abstract. Growing scientific evidence demonstrates that social and physical environments that threaten human development because of scarcity, stress, or instability can lead to short-term physiologic and psychological adjustments that are necessary for immediate survival and adaptation, but which may come, but which may come at a significant cost um, to long-term outcomes in learning, behavior, health, and longevity. In other words, what they're saying is that the adaptations that uh, children are forced to resort to in response to early stress help them endure that early duress and difficulty, but those same adaptations become a source of pathology later on and they even threaten longevity. Now that article came out just six years ago, um, but that's the perspective that I came to uh, adopt or <clears throat> or, or um, understand a long time ago <clears throat> in medical practice. Now, to in order to understand the basis of that, we have to consider how we look at human beings so, and how we look at disease. Now, Western medicine looks at disease from a particular perspective. And you have to understand something about medicine. It's science, all right, but it's also ideology. And there's a difference in science and ideology. There's a lot of science in it, and it's great science. But there's also ideology. And ideology is a point of view. It's, it's, it's a, the Germans say, it's a Weltanschauung. It's, it's, it's a world view that you're not conscious of. That, that you have hidden beliefs that you don't question. And people that question the hidden beliefs are seen as outliers or mavericks. And that's an ideology. And that exists in all realms, whether politics or, or, or science or medicine or, or history or economics or any field of um, human thought or investigation. So there's always uh, ideological biases hidden in any system. And the logic of the system operates within those biases. Now, what are the biases of Western medicine? Well, the bias of Western medicine 
And if any of your medical colleagues here want to disagree with me, I'll be happy to, although I doubt that you will, because I just think that if you're doing psychotherapy, you'll probably agree with me already. But, uh, <laughs> but maybe not. But the hidden biases are, number one, that diseases um, have either uh, physical causes uh, in a sense of genes or external um, uh, forces like bacteria or viruses or toxins, or we don't know what the causes are. So the causes are either physical or the disease is what we call idiopathic. We don't know what the source of it is. So that's one bias, is that causes are purely physical. The second bias is that diseases happen to organs. So you have heart disease, and you have lung disease, and you have disease of the connective tissue or the liver or whatever. And then there's specialties designated to study in depth the diseases of these organs. But, the, but that except for obvious lifestyle, so-called lifestyle mm, proclivities like smoking or drinking, we don't really think that the life of an individual has a whole lot to do with the disease of the organ. So, you know, cancer strikes somebody who doesn't smoke, we don't know what causes it. So we separate the organ from the, the whole person. And then we separate the person from the environment, so that the social environment, uh, we might, acknowledge the role of the physical environment, but we certainly not acknowledge the role of the social environment. So, in Western medical terms, the average physician would not be able to explain to you, and this is not for lack of intelligence, simply for lack of training, would not be able to explain to you why is it that the more episodes of racism a black American woman experiences, the greater her risk for asthma. It's just a documented fact nor would the average physician be able to tell you very easily the, the multiple times documented fact that children whose parents are stressed are more likely to have asthma. As a matter of fact, the degree of the child's asthma has been correlated with the degree of mental uh, disturbance on the part of the parent. So you go to the physician, you get the inhalers, but that's all that happens. And so, nor would, let me just give you another fact, which I won't explain now, but a study in Australia looked at 500 women with breast biopsies who were suspicious, or at least um, concern enough was raised that it should be malignancy or not, so they had these biopsies, and they also had a psychological evaluation. And when the results came back, it turned out that if a woman uh, was stressed, that by itself did not increase the risk of that lump in cancer, so there was zero effect. And similarly, if a woman uh, was emotionally isolated, that by itself also did not increase the chance of the lump in cancer, so zero effect. But if a woman was stressed and isolated, the risk of that lump in cancer was nine times as great as the average. And the researchers being scientists, the medical scientists, couldn't explain this one because they said, it's strange, how does zero and zero add up to nine? <laughs> well, that becomes clear, how does zero and zero add up to nine becomes very clear if you understand that human beings can't be separated from their environment. And what happens inside an individual on a physiological level is very much uh, determined or at least uh, affected by what happens to them on a social level. So, uh, nor, nor would the average physician be able to explain to you, based on their training, why is it that if you look at lung cancer, the more adverse childhood experiences that you have, in other words, the more trauma you've experienced, the greater your risk of lung cancer, and this is true even if you cancel out smoking as a factor. Nor, nor would the average physician be able to say a whole lot about the fact that a Canadian study showed that uh, if you were abused as a child, your risk of cancer goes up by nearly 50%. And this is even after you've uh, uh, factored in or factored out things like smoking and drinking, which abused people are more likely to do. 
So these are the questions that we have to be able to answer. And it seems to me that, that any one of these facts that I just told you, which are not in question, ought to send the whole profession running to figure out the, what's going on in the correlation to physiology and emotions and our social existence. But we don't do that because we exclude this kind of information. That's the ideological bias. And so 70 years ago this year, there was a, a physician uh, called George Engel who called for a different model of medicine. And uh, he said, as soon as I, he said um, that the dominant model of medicine today, talking almost half a century ago, is biomedical. With molecular biology, it's basic scientific discipline. It assumes disease to be fully accounted for by deviations from the norm of measurable biological somatic variables. It leaves no room within its framework for the social, psychological, and behavioral dimensions of illness. The biomedical model embraces mind-body dualism, the doctrine that separates the mental from the somatic. And Dr. Norman Deutsch, who is a well-known psychiatrist here in Toronto, who writes on brain plasticity, he, he wrote similarly uh, just last year, modern scientific medicine has taken a fundamentally materialist approach and it is analytical, meaning that it divides holes into parts. It often proceeds by reducing complex phenomena to their more elementary chemical and physical components viruses, genes, and molecules. So things haven't changed much since George Engel wrote those words. And what he called for was a biopsychosocial approach, which meant that the biology of human beings cannot be separated from their uh, psychological and social environments. Now, at the same time, human beings have always known, we've always known that things can't be separated. So there's, there's always been this um, um, tussle, you might say, between a unitary, holistic view of human beings and, and existence in general, and a dualistic view that separates things. So the Buddha said 2,500 years ago, he says, contemplate the, in, the interconnected core arising of all phenomena. That's what he called it. The interconnected core arising of phenomena. He said, look at a leaf or a raindrop. He says, and meditate. He says, meditate on all the conditions that are necessary for the existence of that leaf or a raindrop. So obviously, I mean, it's trivially obvious. You look at a, 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 a leaf, it contains the sun, the light, the photosynthesis. It contains the earth in the form of minerals, and it contains the sky in the form of the water. So the, the leaf literally contains earth, sun, and sky. And he says, he says uh, the birth of any phenomenon, he says, is, is dependent on the birth of other phenomena. He says, without the many, there cannot be the one. Without the one, there cannot be the many. And that was the Buddha 2,500 years ago. And uh, the uh, wonderful writer, um, Susan Griffin, in her really transcendent book, The Course of Stones, wrote that the story of one life cannot be told separately from the story of other lives. Who are we? The question is not simple. What we call the self is part of a larger matrix of relationships and society. All the lives that surround us are in us. So that's the perspective from which I'll be um, conducting the discussion today. Well, I mentioned uh, that I worked in family practice for 32 years, uh, 12 of them with uh, hardcore drug addicts, the other 20 in a straightforward family practice where I helped to deliver a lot of babies and in palliative care where I helped a lot of people die and everything else in between. And in those years, I found that the people who got sick and didn't get sick, uh, they had certain patterns, certain characteristics that kept cropping up over and over and again until I, I just couldn't ignore it anymore. And the, there's a significant difference between uh, in, in, in experience between a family physician and a, 
and a specialist uh, in that the specialist certainly does know, and blessedly so, a lot about a certain organ and a certain system, but they don't know the patient. And by the time they see the patient, the patient's already sick, and usually they already have a diagnosis. At least we know what area uh, the, the, the disease is. As the family physician, you get to see people before they get sick. So you know what their personalities are like for years before they get sick. And also you get to see them in the context of their families, including their multi-generational family of origin. By the way, just as an interesting exercise, uh, let me just ask you right now, uh, I'm not gonna ask you any personal details, but how, how many of you in the, say, in the last five years have been to a uh, respirologist, a gastroenterologist, a cardiologist, a neurologist, a gastroenterologist, a dermatologist, a, maybe I said rheumatologist, any kind of an ologist, just put your hand up. Okay, great. All right, now, uh, put your hand up again if they asked you about childhood trauma. One person, that's great. Uh, if they asked you about uh, stresses in your relationship with your spouse, a couple of hands. About uh, job stress. Yeah, so we have maybe like a five to 10%, and that's really good if they ask you about it. And I, I wonder how long they took the discussion, but it doesn't even occur to them. But I'm telling you, all of you who went to these specialists were there because of childhood trauma. Virtually all of you. Now there are diseases that you can't put into that category. Uh, there are genetic diseases, like there's one that runs in my family, muscular dystrophy. Uh, if you have the gene, you'll have the disease. It's nothing to do with life or stress, it's just, although that can affect the course of it, but whether you get it or not, is simply genetic. Those diseases are extraordinarily rare. Like one in 10,000 of the population will have a disease like that. Most diseases have little or nothing to do with uh, genetic factors. So these are then the patterns that I noticed in my clients. And by the way, um, when I said childhood trauma, probably some of you are at least internally shaking your heads because you're looking at your life, and I never had any trauma. <laughs> but I'll knock that out of you in a half an hour or so. <laughs> okay. uh, as a matter of fact, uh, as, as a matter of fact, uh, I, I, I conducted what I call the Happy Childhood Challenge, which I'll tell you about more later. Because it all depends on how you use the word trauma. And uh, trauma, uh, for me, and that, that's, that's a whole other lecture, but trauma is not what happens to you. It's what happens inside you as a result of what happens to you. And things can happen inside you for which you don't need very dramatic events. But trauma essentially is a restriction of your capacity. It's a limitation. It's a constriction in the body. It's a constriction in your mental capacity to respond in the present moment from your authentic self. Essentially, trauma is a restriction of your authentic self in the present moment. That's what trauma is for which you don't need dramatic events. So, what were these characteristics that I noticed in people with illness? Uh, I'll illustrate them by means of newspaper uh, clippings from the uh, Globe and Mail. The first one is an article written in the first person by a woman who's diagnosed with breast cancer. Her name is Donna, and her husband's name is Hai. And Harold is the doctor. And Hai's first wife died of breast cancer. Now Donna, the second wife, is diagnosed with the same condition. And you might think, what an unfortunate coincidence. Well, unfortunate it may be, coincidence is not. This guy, for a particular reason, marries a certain type of woman. It's that simple. What type of woman? Well, here's Donna's description of her diagnosis. Harold tells me that the lump is small and most assuredly not in my lymph nodes, unlike that of Heist's first wife, whose cancer has spread everywhere by the time they found it. You're not gonna die, he reassures me. But I'm worried about high, I say. I won't have the strength to support him. Now, you're a psychotherapist. No, noticed anything? 
So this, uh, she's the one that's potentially facing surgery, radiation, maybe chemotherapy. And what is her first and automatic thought? How will I look, to, look after his needs? This will be so tough on him. He's already lost a wife to, bre to breast cancer. So this automatic and compulsive regard for the emotional needs of others while ignoring your own is a major risk factor for illness for reasons I will explain. The others are obituaries, for also from the Globe Mail, from the Lies Lived column. And obituaries are fascinating because uh, they tell us so much, not just about the people who died, but also about what we as a society value. And often, and, and in, in every single case, what I'm going to read you is presented as a positive thing, as a good thing, which is why the expression, the good die young, they often do for, for, for reasons that should be clear to you by the end of this conversation. And these are the people for whose funerals, untimely deaths and funerals, hundreds of people show up mourning this wonderful person. So this man was a physician here in Toronto. He died age 55 of cancer. And the obituary said, never for a day did he contemplate giving up the work he so loved at Toronto Sick Children's Hospital. He carried on with his duties throughout his year-long battle with cancer, stopping only a few days before he died. So consider the scenario where a friend of yours is diagnosed with malignancy. Would you turn to them and say, hey, buddy, here's how you deal with it. Go back to work tomorrow. And all the while you're undergoing <laughs> treatment, never consider your life, never take a moment to see what's stressing you, never be alone uh, to deal with the reality of it. Just work every day until you drop. So this rigid and compulsive identification with duty, role, and responsibility, rather than the authentic self, is a major risk factor for illness. As a matter of fact, any identification with anything outside of yourself is a risk factor for illness. The next obituary um, was written by a grateful husband who's died, died, whose wife died of breast, breast cancer at age 55. And this uh, spouse writes, in her entire life, she never got into a fight with anyone. The worst you could say was fooey or something else along those lines. She had no ego. She just blended in with the environment in an unassuming manner. Now, I'm, I'm married to my wife, Ray, for 49 years almost now. And many times I wish that she would blend in with the environment <laughs> uh, in, in, in an unassuming manner. Uh, as I'm sure you have if you have a spouse or a partner. But if you're fortunate, they didn't do that. They didn't do that. Because what's being described here, of course, is the repression of anger. The repression of healthy anger. And the repression of healthy anger actually disarms the immune system. Uh, physiologically, it does. When you repress anger, healthy anger, you're actually um, undercutting the activity of certain immune cells. This has been shown in the laboratory. I said healthy anger. And so we have to make a distinction between healthy anger and unhealthy anger. And I won't do that now, but but be sure to remind me if I haven't made that distinction clear uh, by the end. Unhealthy anger is rage. And in the aftermath of a rage episode, your risk of a stroke or a heart attack double for the next two hours, according to Israeli and American studies. Why? Because, of course, in a rage episode, you got um, uh, real adrenaline discharge, which narrows your blood vessels, increases your blood pressure, uh, can make the heart rate irregular and even clots the blood. So I'm talking about that's not healthy either. So we have a problem here. If we repress healthy anger, we get sick. And if we, and if we give in to unhealthy anger, we also get sick. So that's the third characteristic, is the repression of healthy anger. And the last one and the fourth one is 
illustrated in an obituary that you'll have to believe I didn't make up. It, it is from the Globe and Mail. And this is from a physician, about a physician in Ottawa who died also of cancer at age 72. And it said here, Sidney and his mother had an incredibly special relationship, a bond that was apparent in all aspects of their lives until her death. As a married man with young children, Sidney made a point to have dinner with his parents every day as his wife Rosalind and their four kids waited for him at home. He would walk in greeted by yet another dinner to eat and to enjoy. Never wanted to disappoint either woman in his life, Sidney kept having two dinners a day for years until gradual weight gain began to raise suspicions. Okay? And this is printed as a beautiful thing. Now, this man suffered from, from two fatal beliefs. And when I say fatal, I mean literally fatal. And if you got these beliefs, drop them today if you can. If you can't drop them, find out why. One is that you're responsible for other people feel. Nobody's ever responsible for anybody else feels. Unless you're a parent, then you are. And secondly, that you must not disappoint anybody. So then those are the characteristics. Um, there's automatic concern and regard for the emotional needs of others while ignoring your own. Rigid and compulsive identification with duty, role, and responsibility rather than the authentic self or the needs of the self. Repression of uh, anger and uh, the beliefs that you're responsible for how people feel and that you must not disappoint anyone. Now, the question is, how do these psychological behavioral characteristics translate into physical illness? Well, before I go to the science of it, uh, which has been fairly well worked out, and part of my... Um, critique of my own profession is that we just don't look at the evidence. So that we, we, we keep talking about evidence-based practice. But I'd love to expunge that phrase from the dictionary because it makes me grit my teeth. Because I only wish there was evidence-based practice. I only wish that in the realm of child development, childhood conditions like ADHD, uh, anxiety, depression, uh, all kinds of mental health issues, uh, physical health issues. I just wish we'd actually looked at the evidence, but we don't. This article I quoted to you from Harvard wasn't published in some fly-by-night alternative uh, uh, medica uh, publication. It was in a major medical journal. It's like makes no difference, makes no difference whatsoever. And the reason it doesn't make any difference is because of that ideological bias that is, a, is an unwitting and un unconscious ideological bias. It's essentially um, reminds me very much of doctors or Mr. Spock on Star Trek, who's the doctor, of course, and he's from a Vulcan, but they have no emotions, right? So when it comes to emotions, he says, that doesn't compute. Well, the unity of mind and body and the impact of emotions and, and of social relationships on physiology, literally, that doesn't compute in the medical mind. And that's why the, 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 the research is just not incorporated into medical practice, despite the fact that it's been published and it's not even controversial. So let me illustrate uh, my point with one particular illness that fascinates me, uh, because it's A, well known, B, um, has been the subject of a public campaign in the recent past. And three, we say that we don't know what causes it. And four, it's almost always fatal. And I'm talking about ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, known in North America as Lou Gehrig's disease. And it's a degeneration, really, of the uh, nerves that activate the muscles that move the limbs and also our breathing apparatus and so on so that people with ALS for the most part become paralyzed um, in the end will have trouble breathing and die of respiratory failure. And it's almost universal, uniformly fatal within 10 years, often much faster than that, except when it isn't. 
as in the case of the physicist Stephen Hawking, who was diagnosed with it at age 21 and was given three years to live and died 53 years later, just earlier this year. In the meanwhile, having become the greatest or the best known scientist in the whole world. Which ought to at least make us think that maybe we don't know everything. <laughs> Not to mention other cases that have actually recovered from ALS. So a woman came to me for a diagnosis, and I think if we don't know the cause, it's because we're not looking at what's in front of us. That's that simple. A woman came to me for a diagnosis once, not diagnosis, for a second opinion, because she had been diagnosed with ALS, and uh, she'd been told that um, this will kill her, which it did within a year. But she wanted me to tell her, or Actually, more specifically, her husband wanted me to tell her that it's not ALS, it's just stress. Well, I had to agree with the specialist, it was clearly ALS, but it was also stress. How the disease began is that she noticed that she couldn't hold the pen or the chalk in, she was a teacher, couldn't hold the pen or the chalk in her fingers anymore because they would slip through. So how she compensated was through that. And she also began to experience uh, trouble walking. And how she compensated for that was to get up early in the morning, like five in the morning, and of course it took her time to get dressed because everything was much slower and clumsier. And she'd get dressed and then wa drive herself to school, walk into the classroom with her somewhat troubled gait, and then grasp the chalk in her clenched fist and scrawl the day's lesson on the board for the students. Teach the whole day and repeat the, ex the performance the next day. And she did that for months. Didn't ask for any help, didn't go for a medical opinion until she could no longer walk. <coughs> and that's when, now it's an interesting dynamic as to why the husband didn't drag her to the doctor the first day. And that has everything to do with their relationship. And <laughs> which is illustrated by the fact that after they saw me, And her, her condition worsened, and it became clear that she would not live. He started to have an affair with another woman, which shows you the relationship they had of his neediness. Anyway, they came to my office, and uh, you know I had to confirm that you know this was the ALS. But I started to talk to her about these patterns. Now, this is the kind of thing that <coughs> physicians would say, uh, with some legitimacy, this is anecdotal, doesn't prove anything. Well, I think anecdotes do prove something if there's enough of them. And it turns out that you'll never read about, meet anybody, look after with ALS who's not like that. And this has showed up in the medical, uh, 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 no matter who, whose life I read about, no matter who, what patients I interviewed, my own case studies from palliative care, they were all the same. This difficulty asking for help, this refusal, this dogged refusal to ask for help. Then I looked up the medical literature, and there was a study done at Yale University Medical School quite some years ago now. In 1970, this article was published at Yale University Medical School. And what did these uh, researchers find? They found that these patients invariably evoked admiration and respect from all staff who came into contact with them. Characteristic was their attempt to avoid asking for help. And uh, they continued. Hard, steady work without recourse to help from others was pervasive. There seemed to have been a habitual denial, suppression, or isolation of fear, anxiety, and sadness. Most expressed the necessity to be cheerful. Some spoke casually of the deterioration or did so with engaging smiles.
And there was another study, which I won't quote to you now, which tended exactly in the same direction. And then I looked up the biography of Lou Gehrig. I knew nothing about the man, except that he had this disease named after him. So as time passes, fewer and fewer people know about him, but he was a great baseball player, a teammate of Babe Ruth's and the New York Yankees in the 1930s. He was one of the all-time greats. He set a record for a number of hits by a Yankee that was only broken a few years ago. So it really was a durable, durable record. But he set another record that wasn't broken for 70 years either. Does anybody enough of an aficionado to know what that record was? Anybody here know what record he set? He never missed a game, yeah, consecutive games played. And it's not that he was never sick. He got sick like everybody else. He just wouldn't take himself out of the game. It's not that he was ever injured either. At one point his hands were x-rayed and it turns out that his fingers had been fractured something like 17 separate times. And his teammates would describe him as grimacing like a maddened monkey in agony as he fielded the ball with a broken finger, but he wouldn't take himself out of the game. And yet, on the other hand, when a young rookie on the team got sick with the flu and couldn't play, and the manager was very upset with this uh, young player, Gary says, what are you talking about? He's got a flu, he can't play, and took the rookie to his own home where he lived with his mother. His mother put the rookie into Gary's bed, Lou slept on the living room couch while his mom nursed this kid back to health. And that's just exactly, you'll never meet anybody with ALS who's not like that. Now, at this point, the question comes up. Are we blaming the person for the disease? Are we saying that they're responsible for their illness? The answer is no, and the answer is yes. No, we're not blaming anybody. Yes, they're responsible. But responsible here doesn't mean a sense of blame. It simply means that how they live their lives has a lot to do with, with their illness. The reason is, and, and, and not only that, if we bring in the question of responsibility, we're actually empowering the client. We're saying that you're, you know, this is, you've heard this version before of responsible as response able. If we're not response able, then what the heck are we? Then we're victims. So the whole idea is to make people response able. And for that, they have to be responsible. They have to look at, well, how was I, do, how was I living my life? And how did that contribute to the illness? Now, why are we not blaming people, though, is because these patterns are completely unconscious. Nobody's aware of it. Nobody decides to be this way. What does it have to do with? Well, for that, you have to go back to childhood in every single case. So the woman with uh, the ALS, the teacher, she was an adopted child. And shortly after the adoption, so, so you understand, any, any adopted child uh, has got a deep sense of rejection and abandonment. That just goes with the territory. That doesn't mean we shouldn't adopt kids. It just means that that's a major factor that then we have to really help to heal. And then, shortly after the adoption, the adoptive mother gets pregnant. Yeah. Now, what do you think the rest of the story is? The adopted child never believes, never perceives, that she's loved and appreciated and welcomed and enjoyed like the biological child. And so she develops a coping mechanism. I'll take care of myself, just love me. I don't have any needs, just tolerate me. That's how she survives. Now, remember I quoted that article from Harvard that those early coping mechanisms then become sources of pathology later on. Because those early coping patterns, here's the problem with them, they're meant to be temporary states. We're meant to adopt these patterns. I mean, I mean if you're familiar with my idea about ADHD, which I've been diagnosed with, it's a coping mechanism. Of, of young infants, when there's stress around them and they can't escape, fight back, or change the situation, ask for help, they tune out as a way of coping. But then it gets wired into the brain and not goes from a temporary state, which is meant to be, to a long-term trait. And, uh, and the coping mechanisms become problems when they go from state to trait. There's nothing wrong with her coping that way if she could drop it once she no longer needed to be that way. But of course, that's not how it works. 
these coping mechanisms are unconscious, therefore they're not chosen deliberately, therefore they cannot be released deliberately either. We're not even aware of them. The problem is that as children, we all face a dilemma. So let me, I'm going to ask, before I explain the dilemma, let me ask a question. Um, if you've had the following experience, uh, just raise your hand, please, that you've had an experience of a strong gut feeling about something, you ignored it, and you were sorry afterwards. Just raise your hands. <laughs> OK, thank you. There's one or two people that didn't put their hands up. Congratulations. <laughs> that not listening to your gut feelings is already a disconnect from yourself. And you just told me the story of your childhood. Because the day you were born, you were connected to your gut feelings. At some point, you learned not to be. But why did you learn that? For survival. So a child has two basic needs. The one need is for attachment. Now, attachment is the, as my friend Gordon Neufeld defines it, is the drive, is the biological, psychological, emotional drive for closeness and proximity with another human being for the purpose of being taken care of or for the purpose of taking care of the other. So there's an attachment drive between parents and children, between parents and children of any, of any species, beginning with birds and upwards. It's a biological drive to connect for the purpose of being taken care of or to take care of. We can't live without it. And least of all, no, no creature beyond reptiles can live without it. And uh, least of all can human beings, because we're the most dependent, the most helpless, and the least mature of any creature at birth. So the attachment drive is very, very powerful in our brain, and it, it explains much of human behavior, virtually everything that you deal with in your offices relate to disturbances of attachments. And a lot of the people that you see in your offices, they have difficulties because they're still choosing attachment over authenticity and attachment on any, at almost at any cost. And it's killing them on some level. So why do these patterns make you ill? Well, the reason these patterns make you ill is because it turns out that as traditional science, as traditional medicinal practices have always known, you can't separate the mind from the body. You can't actually separate the mind from the body, except in medical school, but not in real life. <laughs> I was in Fort Francis, Ontario, for a couple of days earlier this week, speaking to a mostly native audience, and there's the native medicine wheel, which is four quadrants of mind and body and emotions and spirit. And they say that for health, you have to have a balance between those four quadrants. And uh, traditional shamanic medicinal practices, Ayurvedic medicine of India, the Qi medicine of China, all the... Um, medicine men and women of traditional cultures have always assumed and known about the mind-body unity. They just didn't have the science, but they knew it. <coughs> now we have the science, but we no longer know it. And so the science has been worked out. It turns out that the, emo the emotional centers of the brain are connected with, which is to say the psyche, uh, are connected with the nervous system, with the immune system and the hormonal apparatus. And the science that studies the interconnectivity of these ostensibly separate systems <coughs> is called psychoneuroimmunology, psychoneuroimmunology, or more properly said, psychoneuroimmunoendocrinology to include the hormonal glands as well. It turns out that it's not even that these separate systems are connected together. They're not even separate systems. They're one system with different manifestations. I mean, think about it. First of all, evolution begins with a single-celled organism. That cell then differentiates and becomes a multi-celled organism. But the basic functions of defense, nourishment, and survival have to be carried on by the organism. It's just that now you have different cells that, that, that are specialized in certain uh, duties, so that some cells become digestive cells, other cells become brain cells, but they all have the same DNA. 
And even as human beings, we still begin with one cell at the union of sperm and egg. And then we differentiate and we separate. But that doesn't mean we get disconnected. And so it turns out that the nervous system wires together all these systems. So there's a part of our nervous system called the autonomic nervous system, which is the part of our nervous system that is not under our conscious control. So it's autonomic, which is to say autonomous nervous system, you can call it, as opposed to the voluntary nervous system that allows me to s snap my fingers if I want to. There's the autonomic nervous system, and that uh, is what uh, uh, in, and innervates our viscera, our heart, our guts, our lungs. It's responsible for the tension of our muscles. Um, uh, it, 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 the autonomic nervous system, nervous system connects the brain to the bone marrow, <clears throat> where the red and the white cells are manufactured, and it sends messages from the bone marrow to the brain. It connects the brain to the hormonal glands, to the immune organs, to the spleen where the red cells are stored, to the thymus where the white cells mature, and it sends messages from all of these organs back up to the brain. So there's a const so the nervous system is like a giant electrical grid that wires together all these systems. And the anatomical connections have been worked out. That's one form of connection. The other form of connection, of course, is to the hormones themselves. So the hormones from the hormonal glands uh, in the brain, uh, the pituitary and the hypothalamus, and, and then and, and elsewhere in the body, uh, the, the gonads, you know, the, the ovaries, the, the testes, uh, the thyroid gland in the neck, um, the adrenal gland on top of our kidneys, adrenal, top of kidney. These all um, also send secretions, hormones, to other organs, and they have an impact on each other. They're, they're constantly talking to each other. That's the second form of connection. The third form of connection is that each of these systems, including the immune cells, can manufacture messenger substances that are circulated through the blood to the other uh, systems. So it turns out that the white cells in your circulation can manufacture every uh, hormone that the brain can manufacture. So the brain is talking to the immune system, and the immune system is talking to the brain. So when something happens in one system, it happens in the other system. But this is rather obvious, actually, when you think about it. It's just that the, the implications are not obvious to us. So I could clearly and trivially, so trivially, obviously, change your physiology. I could change the physiology of virtually everybody in this room in a split second. And I could do so without touching you, without giving you any kind of a substance, without in any way physically interacting with you. What would I have to do? I would simply would have to um, utter a piercing, blood-curling scream and brandish a weapon at you. And your physiology would change like that. Your hormonal gland would start behaving differently. Your intestines would stop digesting. Your um, lungs would uh, function differently. Your heart would beat faster. Your blood vessels would behave differently. More blood would flow to your muscles. There'd be more sugar pouring into your system so that you could have more energy. And you could be ready for flight or fight. Now, that's an obvious example where the emotion changes the physiology in a split second. Well, guess what? That goes on 24-7. So that interaction between the physiology and the emotions um, uh, is constant. It's just that, for the most part, we're not aware of it unless it's dramatic. But that's the only difference. It's no less constant and, and important. So stress in the short term Um, allows us to escape or to fight back. And it, it's interesting, this conversation is interesting for, for, for specific, specifically for Canadians uh, because of two historical figures. <clears throat> One is um, the great uh, phys uh, physician, uh, William Osler, whose name is still remembered. Uh, there are institutions named after him. And in uh, Vancouver, they give a William Osler memorial lecture every year. And they never talk about anything he talked about. <laughs> and, uh, 
And so there's, and, and he's the one, he's one of the, he's, he was knighted by Queen Victoria. He's one of the founding physicians at Johns, Hop, Johns Hopkins in the States, Baltimore. And of course, he was also a leading faculty member at McGill University. And uh, he's the one who said that rheumatoid arthritis is a nervous system disorder. And he said that before he had any of the science. He just knew it because he trusted his intuitions. He also said that if I want to know whether or not a person will survive tuberculosis, I have to know not what's in his lungs, but what's in his mind. <coughs> so there's him. And he said that in the 1890s. And then uh, a few decades later, from Austria-Hungary uh, comes uh, the man known to us as Hans Selye, S-E-L-Y-E, or give him his Hungarian name, Hungarian like me, Janos Selye. <coughs> and he's the one that did the research at the University of Montreal about stress in the laboratory. And he's the one that found out that stress in the short term, of course, helps us escape and fight back, but in the long term, it suppresses the immune system, ulcerates the intestines, and causes hypertrophy of the adrenal gland. This is uh, Celia's famous stress triad. So the point is, short-term stress is essential for survival, but chronic stress, the same hormones of adrenaline and cortisol that in the short-term help you survive, in the long-term kill you. So adrenaline, uh, which gives you more energy and strength to fight or to run in the long-term, will elevate your blood pressure, constrict your blood vessels, and uh, dysregulate your heart. Now, there's a condition um, which is increasing in the population called high, hypertension, which is to say high blood pressure. And for the most part, about 5% of hypertension cases are secondary. In other words, they're caused by some disease in some other organ, like the kidney, for example, or adrenal gland or something. But for the most part, we, we call it essential hypertension which basically is a way of saying that we haven't got a clue what causes it. And what if I told you that the blood pressure of American black males is much higher on the average than that of whites and they're more likely to develop hypertension, much more likely to develop hypertension? Does that give any clue as to the source of hypertension, maybe? As, to the, as, as opposed to their genetic relatives in Africa who don't have high blood pressure at all? And all you have to do is say hypertension a few times, like hypertension, hypertension, hypertension. <laughs> Anything spring to mind? <laughs> Maybe there's too much tension in these people's lives. And of course, James Baldwin, the American black writer, famously said that to be an American black male is to live in a state of suppressed rage all the time. That's why the blood pressure. So in the long term, that's what it'll do. In the long term, uh, cortisol will thin your bones, give you osteoporosis. Now, when the Osteoporosis Society does its uh, public education, they talk about sunshine, vitamin D, and weight-bearing exercise. They never talk about stress, which is the most important cause. For example, women who have been depressed are much more likely to have osteoporosis because in depression, there's elevated cortisol levels, which thin the bones. Ulcerates the intestines. <coughs> and medical uh, ideology is interesting. Um, ulcers were, were the one thing where doctors always knew that it had to do with stress. Until three or four decades ago, where an Australian, very clever Australian uh, scientist, found this bacterium called Helicobacter pylori. And now if you give antibiotics to wipe out the, uh, the bacteria, the ulcer goes away. So there goes the stress theory, or does it? Because here's a fact that you have to account for. At age 50, 50% 50 of the population will have Helicobacter pylori in their intestines. 50% don't have, don't have ulcers. At age 80, 80% will. But 80% of 80-year-olds don't have ulcers. What is it that makes the person susceptible to that bacteria? That's the question. Guess what? It's stress. So that, that hypothesis wasn't wrong. It just that it had another wrinkle to it, that's all. But we're so quick to, 
to, to, to get anything that's emotional, if we can get rid of it, we do, and then we go to the, oh yeah, it's a bacteria. <coughs> it puts uh, cortisol, puts weight on your belly in a way that increases your chance of heart disease, and it suppresses your, your, your immune system. So let's go back to that Australian study. 500 women, zero effect from isolation, zero effect from stress, nine times the average if you had both of them. Well, now let's look at stress. <coughs> let's say that um, you're stressed about something and you've got high levels of cortisol running in your system and you're obsessing about some insult or a loss or something that perturbed you. You're in a high state of stress physiologically, but you're not alone because a friend of yours sitting next to you says, hey, do you want to talk about it? I see that you're upset. Can we talk about it? What happens to your stress levels? <laughs> but what if you're isolated? Then you might go on for months stewing, about, stewing in your own stress juices. You have nobody to download it to. No wonder then the women who were stressed and isolated had a much higher risk of, of, of breast cancer. Which tells us something, that cancer is not the disease of an individual. Cancer is the result of a biopsychosocial process reflecting your lifelong relationships with others. Yeah? Do you think that we don't look at that piece because it it can't be solved with a pill. Well, we can speculate on why we don't look at that piece. Um, that's a part of it. In that, uh, who funds research? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the people who fund research, and the vast majority of research that physicians uh, run across or come across are actually funded by the pharmaceutical companies who have a particular interest in uh, research that validates their particular approach, which so happens to coincide with their profits. But that's only a part of it. It's much larger than that. Uh, if I have to speculate on the reasons, uh, the major ones are that uh, it reflects capitalist ideology. Because capitalism is all about individual competition, everybody against everybody else. We don't want to think about the fact that they're all one, because if we're all one, this society makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> So, and, 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 and every dominant institution and field in any society reflect the interests and the ideology of the dominant group. And that's the same true with doctors as well. So, so partly it's the materialist philosophy uh, that, that, that dominates uh, capitalist society. Individualism, not looking at the connections. I mean, if we looked at the connections, you wouldn't have had the election results yeah. <laughs> that you did yesterday in Ontario. That's one thing. The other thing is that what I'm saying is difficult for people. People often perceive themselves as being blamed. They're not being blamed, but they perceive themselves as being blamed. And Dr. Christine Northrup, who's a women's uh, physician and best-selling author, I was talking to her, her and she said that there's kind of a conspiracy between the doctor and the patient not to talk about such stuff. For the doctor, it's easier to hand out the pill and it's much quicker. And for the patient, it doesn't bring up uncomfortable questions. <coughs> but the biggest barrier is actually an emotional one, I think, on the part of the physicians. We haven't dealt with our own pain. We haven't dealt with our own stresses. There's a high rate of suicide and depression and burnout amongst doctors. Somebody once said that if you want to start a cult, what do you do? Well, you give people a uniform, you have special jargon, you isolate them from their families, you subject them to authority and leaders, and you sleep deprive them. In other words, you send them to medical school. It's a stressful thing. And people survive it by shutting, uh, people, the, the people enter it are like people like me, really driven. And, and, and you know, I, will, I'll, 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 I, will, I would have done anything to get into medical school and to get through it. 
And so you really are already driven, uh, and, and then, then nothing in education prepares you for it. Anything I'm telling you, not a word of this is breathed in any of the medical schools. And, and then there's the emotional defense of the physician against his or her own pain. Yeah. So these are the factors that, that I think all go into it. They're social and individual. Now, listen, before I take more questions, which I'll take lots of questions, I promise. Um, I just want to finish this talk um, so that we can have our workshop and our conversation and so on. Let me tell you about stress. So there's the physiological, I've been telling you about the physiological stress response. The physiological stress response. But um, that's not all there is to stress. So stress is really uh, a, tr a triad. There's three components to, to stress. One is the external stressor. Not what, that's whatever happens outside you. So that could be a threat. That could be the, the loss of someone, the loss of a job. <laughs> Uh, if you're a conservative uh, <laughs> voter, stress would have been the election of the NDP. If you're an NDP voter, stress would have been the election as it happened last night, which is the uh, advent of uh, Mr. Ford. So stress is uh, external. Then there's the physiological stress response, which is what I've already told you about, the adrenaline and the cortisol, and all the immune... Um, by the way, I didn't, I didn't even finish telling you all the connections. I'm sorry. Let me just hold this thought. Let me tell you one more connection. The gut-brain connection. The gut is not just a digestive organ. The gut is actually an immune organ. It's got many immune centers. And the gut is an organ of sensation. Serotonin, the, 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 the chemical in the brain that we enhance by giving people Prozac for the depression, the gut has more serotonin than the brain does. And so the gut is an emotional organ. Therefore, gut feelings are actually magnifications of impressions that the brain gets, and the gut amplifies them so that you can really know that they're there. And the gut and the brain are totally connected. In fact, the gut sends many more uh, nerve fibers to the brain than the brain sends to the gut. And the brain is reading the internal organs all the time. So there's that connection as well. And there are others I'm not going to go into, uh, but I, I think you received the point that this is all one system. Therefore, whatever happens in one happens in the others. So stress then, there's the external stressor, there's the um, internal uh, physiological response, and in between them, and this is what you've got to work with in your offices, is the, what we call the processing apparatus. And the processing apparatus is that person with their particular interpretations and their understandings and their beliefs. <clears throat> now, I said I would uh, tell you about um, healthy anger versus unhealthy anger. So let me just illustrate that for you now. <clears throat> I'll need another volunteer um, <coughs> somewhere in the side rows so I can have access to you. You're not going to have to leave your seat or do anything in particular. Yeah, you're volunteering. Thank you. OK, so I'll come closer to you. And what is your name? Carrie. Carrie, thank you. Thanks for volunteering. So what I'm going to ask you is, <clears throat> how comfortable are you with the distance between you and I right now? If I gave the rest of the lecture from here, is that OK with you? Perfect. Perfectly all right. Now, what if I stood here? No, but, oh, by the way, I've got to tell you the rules here, OK? Uh, <laughs> The, in, in, in this particular exercise, that chair is your life. Okay. You can't leave it. Okay. Okay? okay? You can do whatever you need to yeah. in your chair, but you can't leave it. So what if I stood here now? Are you still comfortable with this? If I gave the rest of the lecture from here, is that okay with you? No, you're starting in personal space. You got, yeah, okay. So what would you like to do about it? I want to move back. In but you can't. Uh, no, no, the, the, move like this. no, this is your life. You can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> To move. So you're going to move towards me to get me out of your space. Yeah. Very, very good. And if I came closer, what would you have to do? You'd have to push me. And as you're pushing me, what emotion do you think you'd be generating? Probably anger and fear. Anger. Well, fear is there, but it's the anger that's going to get me out. Fear is not going to get me out of your space. Okay. This, it's, it's the anger is going to... So that's the thing about healthy... Thank you. That's the thing about... It. You don't know how many times I've done this, and people never get to the point of anger. 
they'll say I'll tune out, I'll you know, I'll, I'll make myself small, you know. So that's a sign of health, actually. Uh, the uh, um, the the point is that healthy anger is exactly what Kerry demonstrated. It's a boundary defense. It simply says, "You're in my space. Get out." That's all. And it's in the present moment. Once I got out of your space, you have no more reason to be angry. If you went on, he's, that guy's always doing it, he'll probably do it next week, what a guy, what a jerk, you know, and you, you know, that's no longer healthy. Healthy is simply, you're in my space, get out. It's a self-protection. In general, the role of the emotions is to invite in what is nurturing and welcome and healthy, and to keep out that which is uh, unwelcome, dangerous, and toxic. That's the role of the emotion. So with some people, sometime, we'll invite even greater, greater proximity, you know? And others, uh, we, we never want to be anywhere close to them. You know, and that's the job of our emotions, to, to maintain those boundaries. Now, trick, skill testing question. What is the role of the immune system? It's exactly the same thing. It's to maintain your boundaries, to keep out what is unhealthy, dangerous, unwelcome, allowing what is nutritious and um, healthy. And the, and the immune system has been called the floating brain. It has a memory capacity, it can react, and it can learn, just like the brain. When you're suppressing your emotions, you're suppressing your immune system. And what happens to anger that you suppress? Does it evaporate, go to the moon? What happens to it? Who does it turn against? It turns against you. Now you've got autoimmune disease, which, where the immune system turns against you, like rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis. No, Hodgkin's. Hodgkin's is a, is a cancer. So Hodgkin's is a, is a response also to the suppression of the immune system, where the immune system is no longer protecting you. But in the case of um, autoimmune disease, the immune system actually turns against you. Well? I'll talk about fibromyalgia. In fact, we'll have a case of it to... to uh, okay, but hold on. If you look at autoimmune disease, <laughs> I'll tell you a couple of facts. 80% of the people with autoimmune disease are who? <laughs> Women. The ratio of multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune condition, <clears throat> of the nervous system in the 1940s in Canada was about one to one. You know what the ratio now is? It's about over three women to every man. Sorry? It's about three women to every man now. Now what could be possibly be the cause of it? Well, we know A, it's not genetic, because genes don't change in a population over 70 years. It can't be the climate or the diet, because that hasn't changed more for one gender than the other. What has changed? The stress levels have changed. What has happened is that women have always had the role of being the stress absorbers of their families, including their spouses, which is why Married men live longer than unmarried men, but married women don't live longer than unmarried women. <laughs> Put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> Hence, was it Gloria Steinem's famous dictum that a, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle? <laughs> uh, So, but, and that role for women has not changed. But on top of that, women now have taken on an economic role as well uh, since the Second World War. Now, that would be okay if the other role was not more shared, but it isn't. And on top of that, there's less support. Why is there less support? Because there's less connection, more isolation, 
more erosion of community, neighborhood, clan, family, and so on. So what you got? More stress, less support, more autoimmune disease. It's really that simple. It's that simple, except my profession doesn't get it. Which also means that illness um, can be looked upon as a teacher. I'm not advocating that people should get sick in order to learn. <laughs> I am saying, though, that when illness comes along, it can be a powerful teacher if you're willing to look at it that way. So I'm going to read you a quote from one of my favorite teachers. And uh, unfortunately, as much as I've told you, there's so much I haven't told you. Well, here's a quote I like from Susan Griffin, who says, because we think in a fragmentary way, we see fragments. And this way of seeing leads us to make actual fragments of the world. But the quote I wanted to give you was <clears throat> by H. Almas, otherwise known as Hamid Ali, who said that your conflicts, all the difficult things, the problematic situ situations in your life, are not chance or haphazard. They're actually yours. They're specifically yours, designed specifically for you by a part of you that loves you more than anything else. The part of you that loves you more than anything else has created roadblocks to lead you to yourself. You're not gonna go in the right direction unless there's someone pricking you on the side telling you, look here, this way. That part of you loves you so much that it doesn't want you to lose the chance. It will go to extreme measures to wake you up. It will make you suffer greatly if you don't listen. What else can it do? That is its purpose. So we can look at psychological problems, relationship conflicts, and illness as just problems to get rid of, which is what the personality wants to do. And I'll say something more about the personality in a moment. Or we could look upon them as opp opportunities for learning and development and growth. Again, you don't say to somebody just diagnosed with cancer, hey, great, this is a great teaching moment. <laughs> but if somebody wants to learn, if they start asking why, it's a powerful teacher. And I've had many, many, many people tell me with all manner of diseases that, boy, they recognize themselves in this portrait that I pa painted, and it, was, it helped them so much to deal with their illness. And I've had literally taught with multiple sclerosis tell me that the book actually changed their lives. Not that the book changed their lives, because other people read the book and their lives don't change. No book will ever change anybody's life. But those that make the lesson their own and actually apply it to their lives. You see, here's the thing. If you look upon disease, not as a solid entity, in response to my friend's question in the beginning, but as a process. And that process is a certain purpose, which is your body saying no when you're not. Then when there's a flare-up of multiple sclerosis or uh, rheumatoid arthritis, you can really ask yourself, where didn't I say no just now? And what can this teach me? And you can actually avoid the next flare-up if you learn the lessons. And contrary to what my profession believes, that these diseases have a life of their own separate from the, from the individual, they don't. Their process is inside people, and the people have the response ability to affect those processes once they get it, and they drop the automatic patterns that have been driving them, okay? Now, that's really what I wanted to tell you, and uh, there's more, but i just say one more thing about the personality, and then I'll take all manner of questions. So, I said to you before that the personality, for the most part, is a um, combination of some authentic aspects of ourselves and our defense mechanisms. And the whole idea is to help people tease out what is authentic about them, who's really them and who's not them, and to help them to drop whatever is not them. Because whatever is not you that you're carrying is a burden and it's gonna stress you, and you're gonna take on too much in your life. <laughs> and this actually pertains very much to the helping professions. I certainly know it in myself, that the, um, the drive to be needed, 
which is a substitute for the belief that we're wanted and lovable, can certainly uh, actuate a lot of our interactions with our clients to the extent that we work, how much we work, how driven are when we work. So these questions have to be faced in our own lives. And um, we talk about compassion fatigue. And I'm telling you something, there ain't no such thing as compassion fatigue. Nobody ever gets fatigued with being compassionate. You know what you get fatigued with? When you're compassionate with others and not with yourself. So, so, so what, we call, what we call compassion fatigue is actually fatigue of lack of compassion for ourselves. So when it comes to the personality, uh, how it's a compensating mechanism, if you didn't get the attention that you needed as a child, you'll be wanting to attract attention. Now you're going to be attractive, an attractive personality, or physically attractive. Hence, the 15 or 30 billion dollar, whatever it is, cosmetic surgery industry. Just because people don't feel wanted in their lives. That's all it's about. When you weren't granted the approval for just who you were, you'll be consumed by winning approval, by whatever means. Now you'll be a winning personality. When you weren't valued, for who you were, you will be obsessed with measuring up to the people's expectations. So they'll value you. If you were made to feel special, you might become very demanding. If you didn't get the esteem just for yourself, you'll be wanting to get esteem by impressing people. Now you'll be very impressive. And none of these will ever meet your needs because you're getting them from the outside. If you weren't made to feel that you're important just for your existence, you'll become a helper. Now you'll be very important. If you weren't liked for who you were, you'll be very nice. Uh, what a nice person. What a nice person he was. If you weren't loved for who you were, you might become very charming. And so on. So that's the personality. And so again, the, um, <clears throat> the jo our job as healers, as therapists, is to help people um, become their authentic selves in the present moment, which has to do with dropping all these adaptations, not making them wrong, because they were not wrong. They were very right at the time. It's just that they became ingrained. They went from a temporary state to a long-term trait, and now they're a constriction, and that's what trauma is. It's a constriction. And so we carry this constriction with us, and we never expand into our full selves. Thank you.